with crypto, you're buying the hope that somebody else will later purchase that token from you for an even higher price. Bitcoin gave a technical solution to financial sovereignty. Now the way it has turned out in reality is different. On the one hand, people can use crypto and not be influenced by governments. But when I say, oh, bad people are using it, then you suddenly say, oh, no, no, they can't opt out from government regulations. Blockchain is a permissionless technology. Anybody can use it. However, Bitcoin and Ethereum are also traceable technology. Hello and welcome to Connected. I'm Tomasz Koper, sitting in for Divya Gopalan. Something interesting happened at the tail end of the year 2020, when many markets and financial sectors were grinding to a halt because of the COVID-19 pandemic, one thing rose in value by hundreds of percent and for a while was the center of media attention. No, I'm not talking about toilet paper, instant noodles and Netflix combo deals, but cryptocurrencies. The world's biggest already established cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum, as well as some less serious newcomers like Dogecoin, which originated from an internet meme, saw a meteoric rise in value. The volatile couple of years came to a dramatic conclusion with the collapse of the world's second largest crypto exchange, FTX, in November 2022. Almost a year on and with little mainstream media attention in the matter since then, we ask the question, what's going on with crypto these days? And helping us decrypt the topic, uh, we welcome Professor Vili Ledonvirta from the Oxford Internet Institute, joining us from the United Kingdom. And here in Taiwan, we have Dr. Wayne Huang, the co-founder and CEO of XREX. Vili, let me start with you. The idea for a blockchain-based cryptocurrency, um, Bitcoin, appeared shortly after the 2008 financial crisis. And since one of your research focuses is the history of this technology, um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, the kind of ideas uh, that underpinned uh, the whole concept and maybe a little bit about the mysterious creator Satoshi Nakamoto? Sure. So in the big financial crisis, millions of people lost their savings and, and many lost their jobs as well. And th there was sort of general distrust towards the government in regulating financial markets, as well as towards financial institutions, banks and so on. So Satoshi Nakamoto, this uh, mysterious pseudonymous persona behind Bitcoin, launched Bitcoin as an effort to create a payment system and a financial system that doesn't have any institutions in it, that it's fully peer-to-peer, -peer. there are no gatekeepers, there's no trust needed in authorities simply because there are no authorities in the system. So it was this sort of a, a crypto-anarchist or, or cyber-libertarian currency and payment system that he was envisaging. Well, Wayne, I, I know uh, you are involved in the scene now, but you have been involved since the very beginning. Can you tell us a little bit about XREX and also these ideas that kind of surrounded uh, blockchain technology early on? And how have those evolved over the years? Yeah, sure. Um, XREX is a fully regulated, compliant cryptocurrency exchange servicing emerging market small medium businesses and users. Uh, we focus especially on cross-border payments using U.S. dollar stablecoins as a means to uh, pay in U.S. dollars and to access U.S. dollar liquidity. We uh, realized that early on that Bitcoin is going to be world-changing because Bitcoin gave us a technical solution to financial sovereignty, which... Uh, not a lot of countries have. Everybody has limited uh, years to live, right? So let's say I get to live 80 years and uh, I devote a big number of those years, let's say 50 years of my limited 80 years to produce for the Taiwanese economy. And with all my income, uh, I pay taxes, but after tax, do I have wealth? Do I get to keep my wealth? Do I have financial sovereignty over my wealth? You may feel that, of course I do, because I can, with the wealth after tax, I can buy real estate, I can have empty uh, dollars bank deposits. 
But are those really mine? Let's say I decide to leave the country. I can carry my real estate, um, my NT dollar bank deposits are not going to be worth much. They're definitely, if I carry NT dollars paper cash to Europe, to Vili, where, where you are, well, those paper cash are not going to be worth anything. Vili, could I, could I get your opinion on this, uh, sort of the role of uh, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, uh, and, and similar in, in uh, wealth sovereignty? I suppose what... Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto was worried about was not uh, simply that material assets may be destroyed or uh, appropriated, but that um, financial institutions, uh, government authorities, in his um, libertarian worldview, um, could seize his assets um, or or could perpetrate fraud on the people who trusted on them, just like happened in the financial crisis. So his idea was to create this peer-to-peer -peer economic system in which there were no institutions, there were no gatekeepers, therefore there was nobody you had to trust. You could um, sort of hold your own uh, uh, virtual assets yourself. Now, of course, then the, the, the way it has turned out in reality is rather different. Let's adopt um, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's libertarian, this sort of extreme libertarian worldview and say, oh, governments uh, are, are institutions, financial institutions and governments are untrustworthy and therefore we um, have to create a mechanism that sort of uh, liberates um, the economy from such gatekeepers. Even against that standard, um, unfortunately, um, as we've seen with things like um, the collapse of the FTX exchange and many, many exchanges before that, in practice, uh, crypto has ended up recreating the very same structures that Nakamoto was trying to make obsolete. Unfortunately, we've seen in cases like FTX that these new financial institutions are, if anything, even less accountable to the people uh, than, for instance, the Wall Street banks that sold uh, bad assets um, to, to investors back in the financial crisis because the regulation that has developed over 100 years to regulate the financial market is, has not been fully applied to this new crypto financial market. Let's talk about this practice because in practice, uh, a lot of people who invested in crypto saw a huge volatility in market. Prices were going up and down for around two years until they kind of stabilized. Um, so on that note, Vitalik Buterin is a computer programmer who's been involved with cryptocurrencies almost from the very beginning. He later co-founded Ethereum and its associate currency Ether, second only to Bitcoin. We asked him how he felt about the current state of the market. Uh, I personally am very optimistic now. Um, I think uh, the technology has been improving a lot over the last few years and that people are not just um, making things that will only um, you know, survive during bull markets and then collapse in six months. Like People are actually yeah, working on improving the fundamentals, improving the yeah, scalability of the yeah, technology. It's, uh, ability to actually work when uh, a large number of people is using it, solving you know, security and privacy problems and uh, all kinds of important things. So Wayne, um, do you share Vitalik's optimism about uh, where the market is headed and what's happening in it right now? Or is there something that's worrying you still? Oh, well, I definitely share his optimism. Um, but note that you were talking about price action in markets, and Vitalik was talking about uh, what's being developed, what's being built in the blockchain ecosystem. And I'm very optimistic. Uh, it's a new technology. It really is uh, one of the first well understood ways for every individual to have financial sovereignty, right? I don't really see uh, Satoshi as anarchy, and I don't see him necessarily saying that governments are all bad, 
and gover uh, governmental bodies are well, you should read his emails because that's literally what he says in the in the crypto anarchists mailing list i mean there's there's some views i read a lot of his stuff satoshi invention is giving people the optionality to be able to hold your own wealth there will always be good governments and there will always be bad governments as mm -hmm. seen in history and that optionality is very important but you say optionality but in practice 99 percent of people who buy crypto they store them in exchanges like ftx so they're actually not holding on to their crypto. They're not any more sovereign than if you have your money um, in a bank. And when you say optionality, that I we don't, have the option I don't know of where that 99% is coming from. I don't, I don't yep. see the reference to that 99%, right? I agree that uh, in order to have sovereignty, people should absolutely learn about uh, how to self custody. And I also take Vitalik's view that the technology, the user experience is being improved. Right. But I don't know where that 99% reference is coming from. But yeah. I do agree that, you know, holding uh, holding your assets at a, an unregulated uh, exchange is not going to be a good option. But this this idea that people should be at liberty to opt out from government regulation if you, if they wish, I understand that, that that's very appealing if you're under a bad government. But now we have a situation in Europe where cryptocurrencies are being used to fund uh, Russian private armies. So it can it's also a way of evading legitimate financial sanctions. It's a way of avoiding legitimate financial regulations. So I'm not personally of the view. I, that citizens necessarily in a democratic factual. country ought I, to have the right I don't to think that's, from I don't think that's factual. I don't think that's factual. Extracts, for example, we use three AML vendors together, and that's Chain Analysis, TRM Labs, and MasterCard CypherTrace. We use all three technologies together, and they're pretty good at detecting terrorists and um, sanctioned uh, asset flow. Right, but if if we go back to the traditional way, traditionally how terrorists are funded through gold and through paper cash, they're a lot harder to trace than blockchains. Right, blockchains at least we have these vendors, we have these technology in place, and they are working. And that's why you see many terrorist groups have declared that please do not send donations well, through there cryptocurrency anymore. There was just a large anymore. report published by Kiev Independent about crypto exchanges in Estonia and Lithuania being used to launder money for Russian private armies. But you're kind of saying two things here. You're saying on the one hand, people can use crypto to be sovereign and not be influenced by governments. But then I, when I say, oh, bad people are using it, then you suddenly say, oh, no, no, they can't use it. They can't opt out from government regulations. So I, which one is no, it? You know, no. is it regulated or not? Blockchain. Yeah, yeah. So that's your misunderstanding, right? Um, blockchain is a permissionless technology, so anybody can use it. However, Bitcoin and Ethereum are also traceable technology. The fact that they're able to write these reports is precisely because of the availability of technology, right? Whereas if everybody, if all the funding for terrorism goes back to traditional gold and cash, paper cash, it's a lot harder to trace and these reports are not you know that easily uh, generated just wanted to make the point about prices that when in a traditional financial market if you're investing in let's say stock then that stock pays dividends uh, based on profits earned by the company from services that it sells to customers and that way there's fundamental value being created whereas with crypto um, what you're buying is a hope that somebody else will later come and purchase that token from you for an even higher price. So th there isn't a fundamental value being created in terms of, of dividend payments, for instance. So that's why we see this massive uh, boom, bust, boom, bust cycle. Big people get excited about some token. They want to get in on it. That creates even uh, a higher prices. Those higher prices attract even more people until the price is at such a level and everybody uh, has already uh, bought it that there are no more basically no more entrants to this market and then the price crashes there's a crypto winter uh, a year or two goes by 
until there's another kind of hype uh, media storm kicked around um, around some new acronym uh, invented in this space. I do want to continue that conversation, but uh, I do have one more quote on that topic uh, from Vitalik. As we've discussed, governments around the world are beginning, at least some of them, to pay more attention to cryptocurrencies, and there have been attempts to regulate the space. For a comment on that, we once again turn to Vitalik Buterin, the co-founder of Ethereum. Some places, um, you know, like uh, regulation does uh, become very yeah, unstable and um, you know, like things swing from one side to the other and there isn't really a coherent picture. But then in other places, we're starting to see yeah, qu queer and uh, queer ideas of uh, how to regulate crypto in a way that actually makes sense for the space. Uh, yeah, the result's going to be yeah, a very different country by country, but I yeah, think there's enough uh, countries that are doing a, yeah, a good job of this, that for the space as a whole has a lot of room to prosper. Wayne, uh, let me start with you. Uh, what attempts at regulation of the blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies, have we seen in Taiwan? And uh, do you think this is going in the right direction? Well, first, principally, I don't agree with uh, Vili, right? Um, because if we go back to Bretton Woods in um, 1944, the member nations agreed that the U.S. dollar pegs to gold. So post-World War II, everybody went back to gold, right? So the U.S. dollar pegs to gold, uh, other nation currencies pegs to the U.S. dollar. But what is gold? Does gold pay dividend? Gold is a human consensus that formed organically and has lasted for thousands of years. It's a consensus against value, and over time, gold's price became more stabilized. And I don't think it's right to compare gold with stocks. I also don't think it's right to um, compare Bitcoin with stocks and, and, and um, say that because Bitcoin doesn't generate dividend, just like gold doesn't generate dividend, that it has no value. Vili, uh, what kind of efforts to regulate the crypto space have we seen elsewhere in the world? Uh, the UK, where you're based, uh, the European Union, North America? So it, there's been different kinds of efforts. One is around mining, right? So mining is the process by which a proof of work blockchain is secured and it involves expanding tremendous amounts of electricity. The total uh, electricity consumption of uh, the Bitcoin network is, according to some studies, comparable to that of a medium sized country. So some jurisdictions um, uh, like People's Republic of China have simply banned mining. Um, because of this. Uh, European Union has also considered uh, banning proof-of-work based cryptocurrencies, which would have been very bad news for the value of Bitcoin, but um, it did not move forward with such regulation at this time. In the US, there has been a regulation, or rather the SEC um, has applied existing regulation on uh, securities to crypto tokens. So these are some of the, the things that are going on, sort of efforts to slot crypto into existing regulations, but then on the other hand, efforts to uh, introduce new uh, regulations that address uh, issues that are specific to crypto, such as the energy expenditure issue. Well, uh, you mentioned uh, a while back uh, the the next uh, abbreviation, uh, the next acronym that will make people sort of come back to the market. Um, so this is the sort of the last talking point that I have for us today. Um, the NFTs, intrinsically tied to the blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies is another element of the space, non-fungible tokens or NFTs. In a nutshell, they can prove the authenticity of a piece of information like a deed of ownership. Although not legally enforceable in most jurisdictions, NFTs have become popular among digital artists as a way to sell their work online. We asked filmmaker Jay Chern for a glimpse into the phenomenon. We came to Taipei's Treasure Hill Artist Village to discuss the importance of NFT and Web3 with Ezizaros, a Taiwanese generative art NFT creator, and Mashbean, co-founder of FabDAO, currently working for Taiwan's Ministry of Digital Affairs. 
。NFT 对一般大众的认知其实并没有这么好，他们第一个想到的可能是投资，第二个是诈骗。是因为是绑在一起，然后你看新闻就是会看到什么谁暴富啊，然后什么东西暴跌啊之类的，所以 NFT 在台湾的那个基本的印象没有很好，所以我一开始做的时候不敢跟别人讲，我连那个 ID 都是用我以前的 ID 去去重新编码出来的 ID， 然后默默的开始发作品这样子，对，这是最最刚开始的事情。我是做生成艺术的 NFT， 但我并不是很认真想要把作品弄成那种很艺术的东西，而是在想说怎么样跟社会有一点点结合。所以说，我后来的几件作品就有跟 N g o 合作，像是台达电子基金会，他们在富裕山谷的时候，我就有跟他们合作一个案子，是。你如果买了我的 NFT， 那台达基金会就会富裕一株真正的珊瑚到海里这样。对，那我觉得这种这种形式的交流就很有趣，因为你并不是为了一个纯投资的行为在买这件事情，你是为了为了支持我的艺术创作，然后为了捐赠珊瑚。后来另一个案子是跟一个外国的环境保育者合作，它叫做 Castle。那我们做的一个作品叫做海龟视角。想要凸显的是一次性的塑胶问题，所以我们就做了跟塑胶很像的水母。这个案子的最后的收入一部分就是转到那个五大环流研究所那边去。那他们就是一个专门在做海洋富裕的机构。NFT 的意义对我来讲，这一点是蛮重要的。For the full version of this video, which also talks about DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations, visit our website, YouTube channel, or download the Taiwan Plus app. Gentlemen, we are very quickly running out of time, so lightning round on NFTs. Wayne, I know you didn't like the 99% number from earlier, but I have another one for you. Um, so it's recently been reported that um, two years after this bull run uh, for digital collectibles and NFTs, now 95% of uh, those assets are virtually worthless. Uh, do you think that artists should care about NFTs? Uh, again, I don't know those numbers, uh, but I can share an example of an NFT that we created together with Taiwan's largest business media, Tianxia uh, Zazi, the Commonwealth Magazine. Uh, so we filmed a masterclass on blockchains and Web3. I think it's total 14 sessions. It's very well produced. And um, in order to teach people what NFTs are and to teach people the tokenomics that um, we can design by using these NFTs, everybody that buys this masterclass from Commonwealth Magazine, Tianxia Xuexi, Tianxia Zazi, uh, is given an NFT. And using this NFT, they, every one NFT is redeemable for one masterclass. We stopped selling this class after, I don't know, like three months, okay? So then afterwards, uh, for anybody else who wants to buy this class, you can't buy it directly from Commonwealth Magazine anymore. You have to buy the class from another NFT owner. The reason is because we really wanted uh, anybody who has an interest in this class to talk to someone who's already watched this class, attended this class, to get feedback. Is this really worth your money? Is this a class that you're looking for? And these NFTs act also as collectibles, right? People like to, just like when you go to a concert afterwards, a lot of people like to keep con uh, concert tickets. To us, that's what uh, uh, that's uh, a good use of NFTs. Vili, before we go uh, briefly, in your opinion, NFTs crypto aside, in your opinion, is there a use of, for blockchain technology that you think is worth our collective time? Well, the thing is, you say blockchain technology, but blockchain and crypto are indivisible. They're two sides of the same coin. And so, in my opinion, crypto has um, uh, all sorts of, of um, uh, unfortunate, um, not even side effects, because as we remember, the whole point of crypto originally 
was to create a shadow economy outside the control of governments. So it really comes down to whether you think that governments ultimately should be able to regulate uh, payments, financial markets, uh, uh, markets for art. Uh, NFTs are also used uh, uh, for money laundering. There's a lot of wash trading where the value of so so is, so is cash and gold. So is cash and gold. So is cash and gold. Indeed, and that's why we try to regulate them. We don't try to create new ways to uh, to circumvent government regulation. So, so it comes down to really your your values and whether you think that ultimately governments can be held accountable or whether you are a skeptic of the whole idea of government power. Uh, gentlemen, it's been a very stimulating conversation. Uh, I feel that we could sit here for an hour or more and uh, discuss all this. But unfortunately, we've run out of time. So huge, huge thanks to both my guests, uh, Vili Ledon Virta from the Oxford Internet Institute, uh, again, joining us from the United Kingdom, and Wayne Huang, the co-founder and CEO of XREX, uh, talking to us from Taiwan. Thank you both so much. And to our audience at home, it's been great to have your company. Goodbye and stay connected.